It is vitally important you have the right players on your team for the fantasy football playoffs. These are guys that are big names that you may not get the advice you were thinking you were going to get coming into this video. But let's talk about these big names, what you should be doing with them as we get to crunch time. Let's talk about Devon Achan. This is going to be a largely record-dependent one here. Because Devon Achan, uh, in my opinion, ain't no lie, he's a bye-bye-bye. Okay, with Achan, you've seen the worst of the worst in terms of situation, in terms of coaching, and in terms of all that, right? It, it, with Achan, he is obviously dominant to start the season, um, and everybody, as soon as he had two good games, was victory lapping the Achan takes. And again, the, the, the right. point with Achan, who's tw- the running back 22 after this week, the point with him and the concern with him was always that uh, he was probably going to be at higher risk for injury, and you've already seen him have a concussion this year. But he is back. He's been playing without Tua since Tua went out. Eight points, five points, two points, and they had 10 points against Indy. It's not been great. Not been great. Uh, the volume hasn't even been there for the most part. The, the re- receptions have gone way down. The targets have gone way down. But you have two attack of Iowa returning to practice this week. Uh, you have the Dolphins hopefully looking better as an entire team, but specifically as an offense and becoming more dynamic. It's going to be uh, big implications for Tyreek Hill and Devon Achan both. Achan is a dude that when he was playing in, with a healthy two attack of Iowa earlier this season was absolutely freaking dominant. Looked like a complete league winner even in the second round. And so even if he doesn't get back to scoring 25 points a game, what if he scores you at 18? That's elite. But if he scores you 16, that's really good. And I think those are both well within the realm of possibilities for Devon Achan at this point in the season. Now, what type of team do you have to have to buy Devon Achan? Um, I, I think there is a, some risk that comes along with this. 500 or above, I'm very comfortable with it. Less than 500 by a game, I'm probably good with it. If you are a like struggling to, if you are struggling to get back to 500 team, honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. That's where I want Devon Achan because of the upside. So I think that what interesting because because he is a dude that okay. if you're trying to make last ditch efforts to save your fantasy football season, he is a guy that right now is cheap but has the upside to win you games on a week to week basis. And again, if you're smart, you know that he was down at the beginning of the season. He does have Tua coming back. He is healthy now. And those things should combine for a better performance than running back 22 overall on fantasy football. Yeah, I was originally thinking about flipping it where I was like, well, if you're a if you're a contender and you're trying to look for a guy or not a contender, if you're a guy that's one of the top players in your league or top teams in your league and you're trying to get, you know, that extra ceiling push heading into the playoffs and target a guy like HN because you can afford it and you can afford the risk. Um, but if you're, you know, a more middle of the pack guy and you're already at risk of missing the playoffs, you probably don't want to take the risk on Devon Achan. So I kind of thought of it that way, but it makes sense what you're saying. Yeah, I, I mean, he, I, I think that's fair. Yeah, he, he's healthy so. and the upside is there. I think, you know, I think with somebody like Christian McCaffrey, who you're really unsure about from a health standpoint in particular, like, I don't think you can buy him on a rebuild, but a guy that's playing right now where the situation is going to get better. Like for me, like I'm willing to take risks on my like, struggling teams because I don't feel like there's another way at that point you're going to get in the playoffs unless you do. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's kind of why. So yeah, HN, I, I think, again, fair. is a good is a buy right now uh, in fantasy football leagues. Yeah. I think another guy that uh, is definitely polarizing at the moment is George Pickens. Uh, we're, we're touching on George Pickens quite a bit in one of our yards per route run videos that we came out this week in fantasy. But with Pickens, um, there are probably going to there's there's probably going to be a lot of movement with him in your leagues this this week because this is really his breakout week. And it is very much in thanks to Russell Wilson. Um, I think the the biggest argument to this is going to be, and and we've been in this boat in the past. When George Pickens has a boom game, his price always skyrockets, and you're able to move off of him higher at a higher price than you ever were before previously. And then it usually ends up paying off because right after he has a twenty point game, he has a six point game, and then he has another twenty point game, and then he has another two-point game and you never really know what's going to happen with Pickens on a week-to-week basis here's what I know more than I ever knew previously and that is the quarterback situation for the Pittsburgh Steelers it is better immediately with with Russell Wilson stepping on the field it is better than it has been in like four freaking years it's it's that good and Russell Wilson isn't even that good what I think a lot of people overlooked last season is how decent, uh, honestly, average Russell Wilson was as a quarterback for the Broncos. And the reason that they benched him is not because he was bad. Remember that five-game win streak that they went on with him when mm-hmm. he came back healthy? Yeah. It was not because he was bad. It was because they didn't want to pay him long-term when they were trying to build an entirely different team overall with Sean Payton, which was understandable. 
the, the Steelers get Russell Wilson on the cheap, so it looks on paper like they got him for nothing, so they don't owe him any loyalty, which was true. Justin Fields got his, opp got his opportunity, and Justin Fields sucked. And then Russell Wilson comes in, and Russell Wilson does not suck because Russell Wilson can throw a ball accurately, consistently, uh, and can, you know, like make reads and stuff past his first read. And that includes getting the ball to George Pickens on the outside, right? You, you know, you know, Russell Wilson's classic moon ball that everyone raves about, which isn't even that like amazing, but people love it. It was, but um, it's not anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it was enough to get George Pickens the ball. And, and George Pickens is best when he is put in contested catch situations. If we can see more of that over the next few weeks, and I think that's that it's very likely that we will with Russell Wilson starting, I think George Pickens at the very least, is a hold. I initially thought that George Pickens was going to be a sell. When he started producing, I own him in the flock league. I care the most about this league. I cannot stand George Pickens um, because he has just absolutely screwed me this year. It is not really that much his fault as it is the whole offense overall. But what really sold me on Pickens when I was watching that game against the Jets secondary, mind you, and Sauce Gardner, who was lined up against him all day, um, was his red zone targets. And seeing that consistent red zone usage where Tomlin was going out of his way to go yell at Artie Smith and say, give Pickens the ball, um, made me really, really happy. Really, really excited. Uh, more optimistic about George Pickens than I have ever been about Pickens since he came into the freaking league. So I'll, I'll go out there and say that he's a, he's a hold at, at worst. And if you can get him at a cheap price, at a reasonable price, I think it's worth taking the shot because his week-to-week -week upside has never been deniable, even with poor quarterback play. Real quick, make sure you check out the My Teams feature on flockfantasy.com slash domain. You can link your team and actually see the power rankings based on expert consensus rankings from Flock Fantasy of your league. So you can see where you stack up and then you can easily get a team blueprint from there. Team blueprints where Nathan and I sit down and personally review your fantasy football teams to tell you what you need to do to make sure you are contending for a championship, truly contending for a championship in your fantasy playoffs, what moves you should be making, what positions you should be targeting, who you should be targeting on waivers, all of it. It is a very in-depth break breakdown of your team so you can get one of those when you check out the my teams page at flockfantasy.com slash domain which like i said uh you can do some of those things you get the rankings you get the trade calculator for free so even if you don't want to get a team blueprint or my teams go check out the site and then like i said we can do a team blueprint for you they're very pretty obviously and really good analysis come with it but let's get back to it a lot of people are going to be panicking about james cook and rightfully so in my opinion because you have ty johnson coming in having a receiving touchdown this week you have ray davis scoring a rushing touchdown and when you're looking at the running back usage for the buffalo bills this last week uh ty johnson was the third down back which means ty johnson in terms of is he going to be fantasy relevant is ray davis going to be fantasy relevant right now i'm going to say no to both of those guys but they're not irrelevant he had one target did ty johnson ray davis had one target uh and then when you're looking at james cook james cook obviously had nine points in this game but didn't have any targets he basically just had 12 carries he played half the snaps. He played about the same amount of snaps this last week as we've seen him play the whole season, uh, which is between 53 and 60. He's been within that range pretty much all year. Uh, in fact, in the game where he scored 28 points against Miami, he played 47% of snaps. So it, that's not the issue for James Cook. The issue would be for James Cook if those other backs start sniping touchdowns. Because the yep. big issue with James Cook and his upside last year was the fact that they would not give him red zone carries. Yep. He was... 20 to 40th in the league or something in red zone carries last year. So I think if you start seeing this become a trend where you see Ty Johnson getting coal line carries, that's really not good for James Cook's future outlook. Now, what are you doing with James Cook? That's the point of this video. With James Cook, the nice thing about him is you actually drafted him in the fourth round. And so it's going to depend on what you can get in return for James Cook. Personally, I think you have to hold him I'm not opposed to selling him, but I would like to hold him. The reason I'm not opposed to selling him is I think when you when you look at the rankings, and I'll go ahead and look uh, at the expert consensus rankings rest of the season and see where he falls. Overall, still 27th in the league. Next to Nico, Jaden Reed, uh, DK, Devontae Adams, Marvin Harrison, Brian Thomas. Give me Monty all day. Montgomery. Monty and Jacobs still down there. Jacobs. Like I, I would probably pivot to Josh Jacobs at this point, and so yeah. like that is a trade I would look at. Monty is shaky for me, um, but I, I definitely see why you'd want Montgomery. Um, but even some of the wide receivers there, Brian Thomas, I think is a good candidate there. Uh, it, Mike Evans is somewhere in that range. Nico. Uh, no, like I'm just guys. curious here for, for the potentially moving James Cook case. What has he done outside of his three touchdown game? 
13, 18, 5, 17, and 9 he's had, points. He's had solid games. So He's been a low in front of it, it really, excluding that game where Miami just was in shambles because of the Tua injury, um, his his ceiling has looked pretty much identical to Monty's with less consistency. Again, I, I, when you look, I think specifically when you look at the games about touchdowns, 13 points and 5 points, um, what you're seeing is... I mean, he's not, he's getting 70, when he's getting 70, 80 yards, that's great. But it's not like he's been getting a crazy amount of targets this year either. He has uh, one game above four targets or four targets or higher. Yeah. So that's not, I mean, it's establishing a pretty low floor for James Cook at this point. That's why I'm not opposed to selling him. So if you can get some of those guys in that range I mentioned, I, I'm going to go ahead and label James Cook as a sell on here, but hope that you listen to the video and, and know that you probably have to hold James Cook because you're probably going to have people trying to buy, uh, pro- probably trying to buy low on him and you, I don't want to sell him low. Keep I don't want to sell low. Keep Amari Cooper in mind as well because it seems like not only Amari Cooper is getting a lot of usage but it kind of unlocked Shakir and it unlocked Keon Coleman as well yeah. which were just not concerns before Amari came into that offense. So so again I'm going to say I want to hold him but we'll label him as a sell just because I would shop James Cook at this point. Uh, not really as a, out of panic but just because I think you've seen touchdowns be a big factor for James Cook, and they're very volatile. He scored a lot of them early season, and if these guys yeah. have any goal line yeah. carries, if they have any red zone involvement, yeah. it's a red flag for James Cook. Yeah, I um, wish he had a higher floor. I did too. Really, and honestly, he could because they could they could use they him could more in the use passing him like game. That. But, mm-hmm. the, but the fact of the matter is, it's not the quarterback Josh Allen is. It's always been the yep. issue with James Cook in that offense. Yep. So uh, yeah, just see what you can get. Yeah, Romeo Dobbs is a very polarizing guy. Uh, I personally think this year, I think Avery's a little bit higher on Dobbs than I am. Um, I actually own him in the Flock League, and uh, he had ten targets this week against Houston after having him? four. No, I did not. <laughs> Um, because he was coming off of a four-target game with two touchdowns against Arizona's defense, and I did not expect those four targets to turn into ten when Dontavion Wicks was starting and Jacobs was going to have a good day as well. Like, I I don't know, but I'm starting Romeo Dobbs after this week, apparently, because he's had two straight weeks like this now, which, again, we have seen in the past with Romeo Dobbs. He is relatively inconsistent. His target volume is all over the place, which kind of constitutes a lot of variance in what his production is going to be on a weekly basis. Last year, he had two back-to-back games in weeks three and four in 2023 that were both 18-point uh, games. He had 12 targets and 13 targets early in the season. And then the rest of the year, it was all hit or miss from then on out. Um, it, it was really, it was touchdown or bust, uh, essentially, for Romeo Dobbs. It was touchdown or six, seven points. Um, and this season, after what was that stretch uh, for the first five weeks that was just kind of ugly for him overall, I think they've really started to figure it out offensively. And with Jaden Reed being such a, a tough guy uh, to defend against and has really commanded a lot of defensive attention, I think that's kind of opened up the field a little bit for Romeo Dobbs to get this opportunity over the last couple of weeks and has really resulted in Jaden Reed being a little more inconsistent. Uh, Christian Watson also coming back healthy has really helped Romeo Dobbs' production because he is a field stretcher. Christian Watson is great as an NFL asset less great for fantasy when he's on the field man they just look better as an offense they yeah. they they objectively do uh with Dobbs I'm, I I want to know what your take is on these last two weeks of production because I personally based on the data that we have from last year and what he's done this season I don't know what to make of it I don't know if he's a buy or a sell I think, I think he's old I, okay, I think, so we're going in the middle. So I think we're going in the middle because yeah. I don't think you have enough. I don't think you have enough hard. Like, look, my thing with him last year, and again, you can go back and look at the game log. If we can put his game log from last year up, uh, he was pretty typically in like the ten points per game. You didn't see a ton of like eleven points, eleven points. He had some games early in the season where he had eighteen points, but outside of that, like, I mean, the main thing is after week eight, you didn't see him get a ton of targets. Right. So if that changes this year. If he's consistently getting targets, I think what you have to do, because I think he's cheap enough to where the upside is worth holding him, in the next couple weeks, you see what his targets do. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't get high enough targets, but he continues to score enough touchdowns, then he becomes a sell-high candidate, in my opinion. Yeah, he's got Jacksonville next week, which is a really friendly matchup for him. If he has another big game like that against three straight opponents that were really, really friendly for him to be productive, I might be shopping him at that point because he's got Detroit after that, Chicago, San Fran, Detroit again, Seattle, Minnesota, who's really good Chicago yeah. again uh, the the only nice matchup there is New Orleans and now that's it for the rest is, of the season in, the, in Miami, Miami that is the playoffs um, um, but what I will say with Dobbs is I think I think that's a conditional shop if he has another big game next week but he has, skyrockets but, but he has 10 targets then I'm still going to be worth it's yeah. still worth holding him yeah. if he has a big game and he has four targets again then I'm going to be selling him so yeah. I really again I'm more worried that's, about the, the opportunity than anything yeah so uh, I actually am going to do JSN here um 
I'm not going to lie to you, and I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think I'm ready to have this discussion, honestly. As somebody who championed JSN last year, got burned on it, and then drafted him still a couple times this year, and is very well aware that JSN is in a position to be more productive and increase his stock with DK being out for a couple weeks. I'm not ready to have this conversation. Because when I'm looking, I, the, his metrics paint a very clear picture to me that, again, you can get mad at me for saying this. I'm just going to read you what it says, and I'm going to tell you that it's, oh, it, 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 it upsets snaps. me too. Uh, he is first in the league in sl- slot snaps. 80% of his snaps are in the slot. He's f- oh, he, my gosh. He's first in the league in routes run. He is. Uh, so we, we, here's he, what, he could be on the Ross St. Brown. <laughs> he could be. But let's listen. <laughs> let's, get, let's, get, uh. let's get there. A lot of people are going to assume that the, the volume, he's going to get more volume now that DK is out. He's eighth in the NFL in targets right now. Why is JSN not more fantasy productive? And why is he not Amon Ross St. Brown? Is because his efficiency metrics are garbage. They're absolutely terrible. JSN, uh, in terms of... What's his yak? Uh, I, my guess is um, 15th in the league. So like that's about what I expect. That's actually not that bad. But here's, what I, wanna, here's what I want to talk about. Yards per route run. He's obviously running a lot of routes. 77th in the league. Uh, yards per target. 80th in the league. Yards per reception, 90th in the league. Yards per team pass attempt, 62nd in the league. He's running a lot of routes. He's getting a lot of targets already pre-DK injury. And unless the DK injury changes the type of targets that he's getting, which to be quite honest with you, it's pro- they're probably going to go to lock it. They're p- number they're probably going to go to lock it. To be quite honest with you, this was JSN's problem last year that I think all of us suspected we had gotten past. When you're looking at last year's JSN data, obviously he didn't have as many targets last year as he had this year. 41st in targets, only five and a half per game compared to eight this year. Uh, 39th in routes run. So he was getting he's getting more opportunity. Last year, 63rd in yards per outrun, 78th in yards per target, 89th in yards per reception. I mean, I I don't know what else to say other than that. Um, the fact that you've seen the exact same trends with these efficiency metrics through two straight, completely different offensive coordinators. If you can get an overpay for JSM because of the DK injury when he's going to be out sell. for a few weeks, you're going to sell. That's which sucks. Like, I mean, I, yeah. I don't I don't love this analysis. I, I also love the guys I pick. He's second in the league in route, twin, route, route wins this year. And again, the opportunity's there. But I asked Nathan today, off camera, JSN, he's like, well, it's, you know, it's JSN time. I'm like, well, I honestly wouldn't be super surprised if JSN just did what he's been doing. Because why does he just keep getting 5 to 12 points a game? Yeah, And it's brutal, but you got to shop, in my opinion. I, I don't believe that you're going to have a big breakout rest of the season coming from JSN. I don't see it happening. I don't. And and he is 16th in the league in red zone. Why do targets. I feel like my heart's being ripped out? Because we love JSN so much, but we have to be honest with you. As, <laughs> gotta, we got to be honest as guys yeah. who make videos. So yep, <laughs> let's, let's keep going. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson has, has been a really polarizing running back really all season. He's been 21, 17, 19 points, or zero, eight, and four points. Uh, that's that's over a six game sample size at this point. Had a nice Jacksonville matchup where he wasn't able to do anything in London. He's got the Jets up next, Tennessee and Chicago. That is brutal over the next three weeks. He could struggle. There is a silver lining with Ramondre Stevenson, and that is he's got more competent quarterback play than he's ever had since he's been in the league. Drake May is not only on the rise. He he looks really good right now um, with inconsistent wide receivers with a terrible team around him. His ability to shine amidst straight garbage on the offensive side of the ball for the Patriots has been impressive and encouraging for for long term. When you're talking about it schematically and what Drake May is able to do, um, is he really a rushing threat kind of like he was in college? Because that was one of the things that we kind of suspected when he came into the league. Uh, Against Houston, he had five rushing attempts for 38 yards. Against Jacksonville, he had three rushing attempts for 18 yards. So again, nothing super crazy there. He didn't have any rushing touchdowns or anything like that. He's really just scrambling when he's under pressure. Um, There's not going to be – I haven't really seen many design runs for Drake May or anything like that. Um, However – when you open up the passing game in an offense, anyone knows this who watches basic football, when the pass game is opened up a little bit, 
That also opens up the, the running game as well because you can't just stack the box expecting the offense to run the ball all the time when they don't have a passing game. Now that they have a passing game, Drake May 33 and 37 passing attempts the last two weeks for 240, 276 yards for three touchdowns and two touchdowns respectively in those two games. This is something that we're going to want to monitor for the rest of the season and I think might really help Ramondre Stevenson specifically because of the receiving upside that he has showcased in the past. Comes back healthy from this game where, where he missed against Houston. Jacksonville, he only had three targets. Before that, he had four, five, five, and three. He showcased this in years past as well. Yes, he's playing a better quarterback who's able to push the ball downfield, so he may not have to dump it off as much to Ramondre, but he also is going to offer, I, I think I think he's going to be a nice security blanket for uh, Drake May. Your biggest concern is going to be, is Antonio Gibson going to be that receiving option, right? Because he's shown that in the past as well in his respective situations offensively. I personally believe it's going to. Con- I, I think it's going to continue to be Ramondre uh, as the lead back there. I think that he's going to get a majority of the relevant opportunity there, not just in the receiving game, but also in the red zone as well. He obviously is coming off slow from that injury. That's okay for me. I'm willing to be patient for the next couple of weeks. If you can get Ramondre for dirt cheap, which I think is possible. I believe it's worth pulling the trigger. This is kind of a soft buy hybrid hold. Um, don't sell them if you own them. I think it's a bad time to sell them because we're just now seeing what Drake May could be capable of and how he could elevate that offense for the rest of the year. And I think that could include Ramondre Stevenson personally. So there you go. Uh, honestly, the JSN analysis kind of put a damper on that whole video for me. But that's the truth. <laughs> And it's like, it's again, like a funeral service. We, we have to be honest with you. So hopefully <laughs> you can kind of take that analysis and do what you want with it. But uh, make sure you show some love, drop a like and subscribe. If you enjoyed the video, it really helps us out, really helps us grow this channel. Um, we appreciate you guys helping us out with that. We appreciate you guys a ton. Thank you so much. And we'll see you later.